This is the first weekend of Advent and the introduction into our new series. And this year we're actually going to be doing something a little bit different. We are having different families light the Advent candle each week. And so as someone who didn't grow up celebrating these church customs or traditions, um, it actually wasn't until recently that I understood the meaning behind this Advent wreath. And so you may be new to it as well. So the word Advent, we've heard it, we may be familiar with it, um, but what does it really mean? All it means is really a time or a season of preparation and anticipation of Christmas. And honestly, this is about as liturgical as we get here at Hope Church. Each week we will light a candle and discuss a specific word or topic to help us center ourselves and prepare for Christmas. And so on our wreath, we have four candles marking the four weeks or the four Sundays in Advent. And each week a new candle is lit until all the candles are burning on the last week. And this symbolizes the nearing of Christmas and the celebration of Jesus' birth. The white candle in the center of the wreath is the Christ candle, and it's white to represent purity, and it's lit with the other four candles on Christmas to remind us that Christ has come as the light of the world. So this week, week one of Advent, is the candle of hope. And so this service, we are having Ken and Betty Mulholland, you guys can come on up, They're going to come, they're going to light the candle, they're going to tell us some thoughts and reflections on how they focus on hope during this Christmas season. So you guys go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, just tell us some of your reflections on on hope. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, We are Ken and Betty Mulholland, and as Jessica uh, just uh, said, uh, this first week of Advent, we focus on hope. So for Betty and me, hope means uh, God's unmerited gift of grace that he will joyously assure us that he will fulfill each and every one of his promises. Now certainly the most significant of his fulfilled promises is the gift of his son, the Messiah in the infant Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jessica, did you ever wonder why God sent his son in the form of a newborn baby? God could have used any number of ways to introduce his son to his creation. But is there any more joyous, hopeful experience than looking into the face of a newborn? In the face of a newborn, I see the hope and the anticipation and the joy of the future. Thanks be to God that he gave his only son, who is our only hope for the future. So this Advent season, uh, Betty and I will be reflecting on the face of the newborn infant Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we do so with the hope that our, our Messiah will lead us by his strong right hand through the times of earthly darkness, doubt, and pains to our joyous reward and light of eternal salvation. Jessica, Betty and I like George Illis's uh, explanation of hope. And he says that hope is faith extending its hand with light into the darkness. So as we prepare to light the candle of hope, Betty and I have a prayer that we will all receive from the newborn infant Jesus, hope, peace, joy, and light in this Christmas season. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you. Let's thank them. It's not easy getting up here. Thank you. So I love this imagery of the candles and the wreath um, because they're just prompts for us to help us prepare our hearts and our minds and our lives each week for the Christmas season. And so this week, our word and our candle is hope. But the difficulty in discussing hope is that it's one of those words we hear so often that the meaning or definition sometimes gets lost in its commonality. I mean, we're technically attending Hope Church. Hope is a word all of us have heard before. But what does it really mean? What does it really mean? According to Merriam-Webster, hope is defined as 
to cherish a desire with anticipation, to desire with expectation of obtainment, and to expect with confidence. I especially love that last definition, to expect with confidence. Confidence, I feel like, is not something that's easy to come by these days. Especially now, I feel like the older I get, the less confidence I have in myself. As some of you may know, I am uh, married to Tommy, and we have two beautiful little girls, ages three and one. So I am a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a pastor, and I can barely remember anything these days. Um, I am, I'm really not sure what I did before I had Siri reminding me to do every single thing in my life. Like, put your keys in your purse. Like, thank God for Siri. Um, and then you add social media to the mix. And so we're constantly bombarded by pictures and posts and lives that look a whole lot better and more confident than ours. Confidence is not something we typically tend to have a plethora of. But what I love about this is that in the Bible, we see a strong connection between hope and confidence. Look at Psalm 71, 5 through 6. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From my birth, I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. And then again, look at Romans 8, 25 through, 24 through 25. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. There is confidence in waiting what God is going to do or even in what he has already done. Now look at our verse, Romans 15, 13. And this is the verse that's assigned to the candle of hope. It says this. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love this verse. First of all, I'm especially tied to it because it was this time last year, like literally this weekend, that I stood on the stage, I was ordained, and I claimed this verse as my benediction. So it has a lot of meaning to me. But I especially love this verse because it's the perfect reminder and challenge on how we can set our minds, our hearts, our lives on hope in preparation for this Christmas season. But what does that mean? How do we get set, get focused on this confident hope as we wait, as we prepare for the Christmas season? How do we do that? So just a few thoughts on that this morning on pursuing a confident hope. And the first thought is this. Remember the source. Remember the source. I'll be honest with you, um, this is an easy point for us to know in our heads, but so often I feel like we, we forget it in our hearts. We know God is supposed to be our source of confidence, of hope, but we live as though other things give us that. We live as though other things give us confidence and we put our hope in them to keep us happy and fulfilled and needed and valued and satisfied. I do this all the time. When life gets crazy and chaotic and busy and stressful and overwhelming, like during Christmas, I live as though my source of hope is in the balancing of my schedule or in getting through a busy work week or in getting to the other side of the tension or stress or busyness that I'm experiencing. Or honestly, it's like survival mode. I'm just trying to survive the day or the challenging season. And so then you add Christmas into the mix, and we're talking about holiday parties and balancing multiple families and dealing with loss, and then the kids are out of school. And so my hope quickly becomes about survival and time management and going from one thing to the next to the next to the next, or just making it through some really difficult memories and experiences. But here's the thing. What gets lost in all of that? the true source of hope, the whole reason we're celebrating and meeting and preparing, God, God gets lost in all of that. My my entire story revolves around putting my confidence and my hope in everything but God. And in the end, it left me empty and alone and discouraged. I actually wasn't raised in the church or familiar with things like Advent or wreaths or candles or lighting different candles on the weekend. In fact, um, sitting in a room full of people while singing songs and listening to a person on stage give a message, like, it was really odd to me at first. We moved around a lot as a family, and so by the time my parents started going to church, I was actually in the third grade, and then just a couple years later, we moved to Memphis from Orange County, California. Um, So that was a huge adjustment for me. 
And so the Jesus stuff, it really didn't make any sense. And it wasn't until later in life when I put my hope and my confidence in any and everything other than Jesus did I realize, okay, I need help. I need help. I had made a pretty good mess of my life. And Jesus was the only one who met me in that mess, who picked me up and gave me an entirely new life and story and journey. I was a sophomore in high school, and I knew pretty much nothing about the Bible except that I needed people to help me begin my new journey, my new story with. And that's ultimately how I ended up here at Hope Church. But if I'm being completely honest, it's still a battle in remembering my source. Even though I made that decision years and years and years ago, every day I am faced with obstacles and people and something telling me to put my hope in them, not in God. So it's a battle. And I need Paul's reminder to us in Romans 15. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. See, God is not only the origin of hope, but is also the object of it, meaning he causes it and exemplifies it. God gives hope, inspires hope, and he is hope. See, if our source of hope this season is in maintaining a challenging work schedule or arranging family dinners or presents just right or in getting every single person in our family the exact right gift, I'm a gift person, so this is like a thing, but really if it's in those things or in making sure for just one 24-hour period of time our kids behave or life is easy or making ends meet or, or being in the right relationship, if that is where our source of hope is, then life will be up and down and inconsistent and we will be on an emotional roller coaster and if anything goes wrong and doesn't work out, we're devastated. Why? Because we've put everything in the wrong boat. So the question is, where or what is our source of hope? Where are we putting our hope, our confidence, our trust? And especially when it comes to the month of December, where is our hope lying this season? So first in pursuing a confident hope and preparing for Christmas, remember God is the source. And then secondly, know that in trusting, we are filled. In trusting, we are filled. Filled seems like an ironic word to be talking about today. Number one, it's just like a few days after Thanksgiving and I'm still full from all of the food. And then number two, uh, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. And thinking about Christmas this weekend feels a little bit like walking into Hobby Lobby in July and seeing the Christmas tree set up like I'm not ready for it. Just mentioning the word Christmas makes me feel a little bit panicky. But look at the second half of verse 13 in our passage. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. This resonates with and challenges me. I mean, let's be honest, the idea of being filled with joy and peace, it seems impossible this time of year. But this verse promises us that as we trust in God, he fills us, not just sprinkles us or just gives us like tiny little breadcrumbs, but he fills us with joy and peace, not just one or the other, but both, joy and peace. And they are connected to our faith, to our trust. For Paul, the author of our passage, joy is huge. He speaks about it more than any other author in the New Testament, roughly 21 times, which is crazy because he had one of the most trying, difficult callings and set of life circumstances. And for him and for us, true joy and peace are impossible apart from trusting God. Temporary joy, temporary peace can happen, yes, 100%. But full, deep, overwhelming, constant Joy and peace only comes from trust in God. Paul is challenging us to a completely new way of living, a new way where we can be filled with joy and filled with peace and filled with trust. And if you're anything like me, I feel like I'm running on empty more than I am fulfilled or complete, which is part of the reason why I love this verse so much. It reminds me not only to keep and make God my source, but as I trust in that source, I am filled with joy and peace. I just love this verse in the uh, message translation. It says, Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that your believing lives, filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. I love that. I love that. Be filled with joy. Be filled with peace. Be filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit. 
I feel like the concept of hope and joy and peace, it's something we hear about, but it almost becomes like this mysterious foreign concept that we know about, but we aren't really sure, like, how can we access that or obtain it? I mean, how do we really get joy? And not the kind of joy that's just a feeling or about putting a smile on our face and being happy all the time, the kind of joy that isn't dependent on our circumstances, but instead the kind of joy that is deep down in our souls, that is something not determined by our circumstances or family members or relationships or job situations. It's a, just a deep sense of knowing it's going to be okay. And that we are blessed beyond measure because at the end of the day, none of us deserve the life we've been given. It's a joy that is found in where our source of hope lies. I mean, the very fact that we have air in our lungs and that our heart is beating and that the sun is shining, these are blessings and peace. How often are we filled with just peace, with a deep sense of knowing God is in control and we are not, and knowing we can let go and we can trust. I'm type A, so this is, this is a hard one for me. So how do we get that? How do we get that kind of joy? How do we get that kind of peace? How do we do that? Look at verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. How? As you trust in him. As you trust in him. Trust. That's how we're filled. And to be honest with you, I don't really like that answer. I really don't. I mean, I have to first trust and then I'm filled. I'd rather be filled first and then trust. Like, okay, God, give me the joy, give me the peace, and then I'll put my trust in you. But that's not how it works with God. As we trust in our impossible set of circumstances or in our loss or in our pain or in our weakness or in our schedule or in our wherever we are today, as we trust God in that, he fills us with joy and peace. But we have to trust first. We have to trust. It's always been a little ironic to me how this is supposed to be the happiest season of all, but yet I feel like far too often we carry around this weight that steals our joy and steals our peace year after year after year. The weight of the overwhelming busyness, the weight of loss, of anxiety, of finances, of relationships, of stress, of time management. Paul says this in Philippians 4. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we actually make this year a little different than the last? How do we trust? How do we get filled with joy, with peace? So I'm super practical when it comes to this stuff. And so for me and for my family, it starts with being intentional today, today. Before the chaos begins, before the dinners and the meetings and the parties and the shoppings and the deadlines, before all of that starts, Start setting goals and expectations now. Getting ahead of all of that stuff this upcoming month tends to bring. That has been a, a very, very helpful first step for me and for my family. But the reality is, like, at the end of the day, all that stuff, the shopping, the parties, the deadlines, the meetings, all that stuff, it's still going to happen. It's still going to come. So the question is, what do we do when we're in the middle of it? What do we do? So a couple weeks ago, I got this uh, fancy new watch in the mail. Uh, it was an anniversary present from Tommy. He did very good. Uh, I, I was slightly obsessed with these uh, multi-purpose fitness watches that are trending right now. And so when this came in, it was my gift from Tommy. I was really, really excited about it. And so one of the features of this watch is that it sends you these uh, little health alerts throughout the day. And so randomly it will vibrate and tell me I've been standing too long, I need to sit, or I've been sitting too long, I need to stand, or that I need to take out some time in my day and focus on my breathing. Like I didn't know that was something we needed to do for our health, but apparently it is. And so it would just tell me to do these things, stand, sit, inhale, exhale, and to do all these other kinds of things throughout the day. And at first, um, not only did it completely scare me to death, like I thought I was having a heart attack when these notifications started going off, um, but it started bugging me. It kind of felt like my watch was bossing me around all day. Like, I live with a three-year-old who really does boss me around all day. And so I felt like, okay, now my watch is bossing me around and I just like couldn't take it. Stand up, sit down, breathe, inhale, exhale. It was the oddest thing to get used to. But then, after I got used to it, I actually started liking it. Because ultimately what it was doing is it was forcing me to stop 
in the middle of my day and to do the things I know I need to be doing. And it was just these little reminders throughout the day. So here's what I'm doing. I'm setting a reminder on my phone, which will go to my fancy new watch, at a time when I know I am least distracted. And here's what I'm putting as my reminder, this verse. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. So every day at a set time, this verse pops up. And what it's doing is it's reminding me in the middle of my day what's most important. Yes, this may seem a little silly and frankly really sad that I need these reminders, um, but it's working for me and it's helping me to remain focused on what matters and not get distracted by all of the stuff that tends to suffocate us this time of year. So what is it for you? What is it that's going to stop you in your tracks and get you focused? Is it a reminder on your phone? Is it a word or a verse written down somewhere where you'll see it every single day? Is it maybe a specific time? So maybe on your way to or from work or your way to or from pickups and drop-offs of school? To set your mind on what's important, to spend time thinking about or maybe even just thanking God for what's been happening that day. So this verse, it challenges us to remember our source and then to know that as we trust in God, we are filled with joy and peace. And then lastly, so that we can now abound and overflow. So that we can now abound and overflow. See, Paul challenges us to remember our source, to put our faith, our hope in God, and then he shows us his benefits of it, right? We get joy, we get peace. And then now, the ultimate goal and the ultimate result of doing this is so that we can abound and overflow with this confident hope. As we seek God, as we trust God, we are filled with joy, filled with peace, so that we can then be filled, be satisfied, and then abound and overflow with hope. One of the things I love about having all of these different translations of the Bible is that the core message is still the same. But the different translations give us these little different perspectives to help us see what God is really saying. And so our verse last time in the Amplified Version says this, May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound and be overflowing, bubbling over with hope. Bubbling over with hope. I love that. Imagine what a world, a Christmas season would look like if we became people who were abounding and overflowing with hope who were not only filled with true peace and love and joy, but were overflowing and abounding with them. And what if we, if the church were filled with people that didn't let the world turn them negative or insecure or hopeless or discouraged or tired or exhausted zombies going from task to task to task to task, but instead were abounding and overflowing with hope and love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I love this imagery. And the truth that in knowing God doesn't just fill us, he overflows us. He offers abounding hope and joy and peace as we put these things into practice. So this is great and all, but we have to take a moment to be really, really honest. Monday is going to be here before we're ready. And we have work and we have kids and family and relationships and, well, we have life. And so the question remains, how will we spend these next 30-ish days? It might be chaotic. It might be busy. I mean, kids will be out of school. Like, that's guaranteed. Family might be visiting or we might be visiting them. We've got gifts and church and people and expectations. All of it will happen. But how will we spend it? How will we remain focused on this confident hope we have in Christ, on the abundance of peace and joy and love only he gives? How will we do that? Because the reality is the choice is up to us, what we will or what we won't focus on. Hope is not some mysterious feeling or concept that we can't actually practice or obtain. It's accessible and it's life-changing. I mean, half of the battles in my life revolve around not having hope that things will change or get better or be different or fill in the blank. But God says something different. He allows us to have a confident hope in knowing that he is God and I'm not. And that it will be okay and things will come together when they're supposed to in God's timing. 
Is that a tough reality to grasp and hold on to? Like, yes, 100%. But as we trust, as we hold on to this truth, we become better people, people overflowing and abounding with hope and faith and love and joy and peace and patience. So my challenge for us this week is to fight to stay focused on hope, to fight to stay focused on hope, on the good, on the things that bring love, joy, peace, hope, not on the things that steal it. And for us to begin doing that now, today, to begin talking about how we are going to pursue this confident hope and naming what practices or changes we are going to make that are going to help us this year and decide what we can do every day just to give us a little bit more hope. Maybe it's as simple as at the end of the day, say two minutes before we close our eyes and go to bed, just saying, okay, thanks God for one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't have to be a big list, maybe just the top five things that God gave us and that we gave us hope that day, that filled us, that remind us, reminded us of God's goodness. This way we begin setting our minds on the good, not on the tiring or overwhelming or exhausting list of things we either need to do or didn't do, but instead on God and the hope and the fulfillment he offers. Let's make this Christmas season different and start now and start today with this hope we can have in Christ. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you offer hope. And not just a little bit of hope or sprinkle of hope, but you offer abounding and overflowing hope. Hope that we can have that can fill us and just pour out of us everywhere we go. God, help us to seek you for that hope. Help us to trust in you for that hope because the reality is there's so many different things and people and places telling us to put our hope in them. But God, in you, that's when we get filled. That's when we get overflowing and satisfied, only when it's in you. So we thank you, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you're a God that walks through this with us, that you're a God that doesn't just leave us alone to figure it out on our own, but you walk alongside us each step of the way, encouraging us, reminding us, helping us in this journey. So God, help us to trust you this week, just a little something, just a little piece every single day. Help us to trust you, to rely on you, and to remember the hope we can have in you alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen.